I got a, uh, I'm giving back papers on Antigone disobeying Creon, and I got a lot of uh, people on both sides of the fence, which was interesting. Some people, yes, she should so disobey him, which I thought I was gonna get, I think it was heavy, that direction, but there were some really good arguments for, no, you should obey civil authority, and he attacked his city, and that was just wrong, and he deserves everything he gets, so. Well done. Okay, we have Raymond. Yeah. Some people... What was the ratio of that? Oh, I don't know. We're going to say a 75-25% a This is not a exact statistical analysis of the papers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is me kind of remembering. But I think most people, like, yeah, she should do that. Um, but I was, I was surprised that anybody argued the other way. I'm still feel like I am missing some parallelism and some antithesis. And I, if I could not, if I could find it, I labeled it, even if you did not. Um, also, I'm not sure everybody is on board. Does everybody understand that we're doing two different kinds of parallelism? Yeah. Like one with words and one with phrases? Right, this isn't directed at everyone. I just, and it's not even only directed at this class, but. Um, Okay. Anna. Meredith. Marta. Pass it on to Marta. It's not, don't be alarmed if you got a lot of right. Okay, this goes over to Mark. And I, oh, Thomas, I have yours. I'm pretty sure that's yours. And Helena. All right. Did I, did I mark on anybody's paper, please ask me about or mention something? Uh, so try to remember to include your parallelism and your antithesis. Um, I was reading something. I'm always reading something. That's the problem, and I can't remember what it was. Anyway, I, I almost marked it and brought the book in. I think it was a, a history book that I was reading. And it was just a paragraph of antithesis. It was it was sort of like the beginning of, of Tale of Two City. It was... It was it was really awesome, and I thought, that's what I need my kids to aspire to, a whole paragraph of antithesis. Raymond says, no, no, we're not going to do that. Um, is, there, is this like the invisible student, or is this? Oh, okay. Neil, do you like being on the outside, or do you want to be closer? Okay. So I will just, I will use this chair for my own devices. Uh, Okay. Oh, yes, Thomas, you have your own chair. Um, yes. Oh, you have a ask me? Um, no, it says something else. Oh, okay. See. Oh, could you ask me to share this with the class? Okay, now I have to. Oh, um, so Neil used an example. And. Uh, about the gods respecting, uh, the pagan gods respecting dead bodies. And he went ahead, and he's, Neil's not the only one who did this, all right, but just when I ran across it in Neil's, I thought this is a good thing to share with everyone. He used uh, the treatment of Hector's body being uh, disliked by the gods. That's not, that's kind of putting it mildly. Being condemned eventually by the gods as an example of how the gods feel about our treatment of bodies um, in the pagan world. <clears throat> and so, and I've written this down on some of your papers in the past, whenever you can find a specific example, it strengthens your argument. Now, I know technically you might say, well, but a single example is just one example. It's what they call anecdotal evidence. You know, if I, if I say, brown shoes are lucky for me because whenever I wear brown shoes, I find money on the ground. That's not really a universal law. It, it does not in, imply that if everyone goes out and buys brown shoes, there's just gonna be money laying everywhere. And people are just gonna be snatching it up. You know, that's anecdotal evidence. It just happened to me. So a, an example is like that. But when you can have an example, or even better, more than one example, it strengthens your argument. This is also, let's, let's be honest, 
a useful tool if you want to fill out a paragraph because you feel like you're lacking material. All right, just like, this is all I really have to say, but this is not really long enough to be a paragraph. So give me an example, and there's a few more sentences just given to you on a silver platter by finding a case where somebody respected or disrespected a body or you know whatever other example that you might have. But examples make your reader think you really know what you're talking about, even if you don't. You know, you can you can you can snow them into thinking that you know your material. Because I'm like, why? He came up with an example. Are you kidding? It must be true. So, uh, whenever you can use an example, that's always a good a good thing, and it can be your friend when you just feel like you're running a little short of material. Um, did anybody else? Did I write anything on anyone else's paper? That yes, ma'am. I know that the mind was kind of like obscure a little bit, like because you said like it was like my my view on things like was a little bit more clear towards the end of the Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, I, kind of, well, I kind of was like a little lazy. Well, well, also, but Marta, do you mind if I just sort of assess you in front of everyone? Like she's like, yeah, I'm so glad on recording and everything. Uh, Marta, you are philosophical in nature and not as concrete, I feel. And so when you, you, you like to write, you, you just kind of ethereally explore an issue, but sometimes you just don't bother to tell me. Should she? Shouldn't she? And it's always interesting to read. And, and that has its place too. Martin never lacks for material. That's one thing. Because she just explores it. We're just gonna just gonna explore. And if I'm reading, I'm like, well, this is all very interesting. But I'm two-thirds of the way through her paper and I just don't know. Should Antigone have disobeyed or not? So I also feel like, Marta, sometimes you just don't want to hurt my feelings by disagreeing with me. It's like, oh, maybe she thinks the other side, and when I say it, I've committed myself. So, but don't be afraid to commit, all right? Just, and it's okay. And, and I said before, just because you argue a side doesn't mean I necessarily think you believe that side. You might just be stretching your, you know, argumentative muscles and, and seeing if you can argue a side that you don't agree with. But... But this is, this is dangerous also. Those of you who are just good with words, people who, who tend to be good with words tend to be that way and uh, <clears throat> a, a little more beat around the bush and less to the point. So I hope that's a compliment, Marta. I, that was all meant as a compliment. <laughs> it means that you're good with words and you, and you can see all many sides of an issue and you like to explore things theoretically. But eventually we do have to say, you know, this is the answer to your question for purposes of this paper. Yeah, yeah. All right. Awesome. Our uh, art of the week, uh, it's going to be architecture of the week for a while here. We have more buildings built by Pericles uh, using funds that were supposed to be. Oh, you all have a paper sitting there in front of you, don't you? But nobody says. <laughs> Again. <laughs> And I don't read. See, it says, collect summa on Corinthian statement. I write myself notes to tell oh, myself. So I only did one of the parallelisms, but. Um, oh, it's okay. Yeah. You know what? This was, and I've been kind of being, no, see, I've been real chill about you doing it in the well, short answer been, things. Oh, okay, I see that. No, I haven't been I haven't been nailing people for that. And I and I think that's why we, we do one of those and then we do a longer one and I forget to mention it when we do the long one. Oh awesome. Okay, great, great. And great. Well you can just from here on out you can put your in energy towards the thing we discussed. Um, yes. I will see if I can find it, and if I don't find it, I might say, where is it? But Yeah, I've been putting P1, have you put P1 and P2 for the two different kinds? But but it's obvious to me, some of you, it's obviously in your paper, you just forgot to label it, and then I go in if I notice it and label it. But when I have a whole stack of papers, I try not to do more than a few at a time, because I don't want to get wear myself out and get lazy. So I tried it only three or four, and then I put them aside. 
I just carry the stack around with me all week <laughs> with a red pen. But <clears throat> yeah, I don't want to, I want to take the time and you're like, oh, I'm tired of reading papers. So, but even so, I may miss. So I apologize in advance if I say, where is your antithesis? It's right there. Okay, um, okay so back to our, our uh, buildings on the Acropolis. So Pericles, using the Delian League money, uh, beautified the Acropolis which I have mixed feelings about, but they did suffer tremendously in the Persian War. And we have a tiny, uh, here, I'll bring it over to, I'll put it there, oh, because I can't remember to go up or down. This is a temple of Nike on the Acropolis. It's, I don't know how to, I don't know. Okay. Oh. And, no, it's, That's okay. We don't judge. <laughs> um, this is a small temple. Oh dear. Did I rip it out of the wall? Uh, no. no, we're good? All right. Um, Did they sell it like Nike the brand? Yes. <laughs> because that's why Nike is called Nike. It means victory. Actually, it's the Greek word for victory. <laughs> Nike. Did they do the little symbol why. too? They did not do the little oh. symbol. Um, <laughs> I don't. I heard that was true. I was like, no oh, offense, Marta, but I don't believe that. I, like, I can't prove it's not true, but that sounds like an urban legend, yeah, not like, a legit thing. But, yeah. but and, and there's a there's a Asics is also is it still a brand? Yeah. All right, and um, uh, okay, it's a Latin. It's an acronym for Latin. Um, anima sanus, uh, anima sana in corpore sano, uh, a healthy mind and a healthy body. That's a Latin phrase. Anyway, like nobody cares. <laughs> Don't look at me. She's lost it. Okay, back to Nike. Yes, the the goddess of victory, named Nike. It's obviously blocked up. You can't go in it. I'm not sure why some of these buildings have been sealed off, so you can't see the interior. Maybe for safety and, and sake. But so if you are on the Acropolis, so I'm climbing the stairs that go up, and it's right up, huge, looming over the edge. So. The entrance uh, path that people would go in the ancient world. It, today it's a staircase that goes like this, but then it was a big ramp, a processional way, and you would see this small temple of uh, victory at the top, uh, paid for by the Delian League. There's our Without art of the week. Consent. Without their consent. Uh, go ahead and get your, open up your questions. I tried to organize myself this week. Last week I was kind of all over the place because it just seemed like too much material. And I made the hard decision to just leave some stuff out in our discussion. Um, oh, but the first thing I want to do is talk about your writing. Turn to page 85. Let's just tackle that first. We are going to write an encomium or an invective. Well, I say you could write an invective. Yeah, okay. An encomium is praise of a person or a place or, or a thing. Um, generally a person, but I'm, I'm going to give a lot of leeway on this, okay? An invective is the opposite. It is attacking a person or a place or a thing. I have given you an example of an encomium. Do you see how invective would be the opposite of everything? Like everything you would be praising in an encomium, you would be attacking in an invective. Yes, Thomas, did you have something to say? No. Nope. Okay. Um, I didn't say anything. Okay, we heard a noise. It just, there was a noise. No. <laughs> um, so let's take a look at what an encomium looks like. This is very similar to the crea. Do you remember when we praised a saying? 
These are just exercises that they did in the ancient world. The purpose of these is to make you have to brainstorm ideas. All right, just to make you fill in as many ideas as you possibly can and then choose from them. So we start out by introducing our subject, just like we always do when we write anything. Now, there is an encomium. Aphthonius is a guy who did a bunch of examples for, for training people to do this, and this is his encomium of Thucydides. Awesome. Okay, so I'm gonna, we're going to look at the section, then we're going to read his encomium and find out what it sounds like. The first thing we do is introduce our subject. And I'm going to read his first paragraph. It is right to honor those who have made useful discoveries for the good things they have provided and to refer what they have brought to light back justly to those who disclosed it. So I will praise Thucydides, choosing to honor him with his own eloquence. It is a noble thing to honor all discoverers. But Thucydides above the rest, just as he discovered the finest thing of all. For it is not possible to find anything in existence superior to eloquence, nor to find anyone more skilled in eloquence than Thucydides. So what is this thing that he discovered? Y yes, but it's eloquence. They're not saying that he discovered the concept of eloquence, but that he found it and he used it for himself. Does that make sense? So when, when Athonius goes on and on about this thing, this wonderful thing that he has, yes, we're going to mention this, obviously, but first of all, he did it eloquently. So we're going to, that's our attention grabber. Who is this Thucydides? What did he do so great? He was eloquent. So the first thing we do is we just introduce our subject. And obviously, if your subject is something you're praising or someone you're praising, you're going to make them sound as good as possible in every way possible. And if you're doing an invective, if you're, you want to make them sound as ghastly awful as possible by bringing in whatever you want. He brings in eloquence to start us out. Our next section, praise their origin, nation, homeland, ancestors, parents. Thucydides came from a land which gave him both life and art, for he was born in the very same place as eloquence. Nice, Athens, home of the orators and the great speakers. Now we've tied him together. He came from the home of eloquence. Though Athens the mother of his life, I'm sorry, that should be through, that's a typo. Through Athens, the mother of his life, he had kings as ancestors and his fortunes were enhanced by his ancestry, possessing both powerful ancestry and citizenship of a democracy. He applied the advantage of each to the other's correction. He allowed equality of speech to correct the injustice of wealth. He used wonderful eloquence to make up for the fact that he was wealthy. He's living in a democracy, but he's one of the wealthy class. While avoiding the poverty of a common citizen by virtue of his prosperous descent. But he's also not just a nobody here. So we want to praise where he comes from. Second, or third, I'm sorry, education. Coming of such stock. He was reared under a constitution and laws manifestly superior to others. Because he was able to live at once by arms and by eloquence, he aspired to combine in one person both culture and generalship. He neither divorced eloquence from arms nor set battles in the place of culture. He made a single practice out of things of which there is no single art uniting in one what is separate by nature. He combined eloquence and battle, eloquence and war, in his book and also in his career, because he comes down to us as a historian, but his job was a general. Then we praise his achievements. And at the top of the page, you can see those achievements can fall in any of, th 
any or all of three categories. Achievements of the soul, wisdom, courage, those sort of virtues. Achievements of the body, strength, speed, uh, success in battle, and achievements of fortune. We would not think of those as being achievements, would we? You were just blessed with something. And we wouldn't think of praising you for that. But they would, yes. <clears throat> yes. Yes. Um, okay, so let's see how uh, Athonius uh, praises Thucydides. When he reached adulthood, <clears throat> he sought an occasion to display the skills in which he had been well-schooled before. Fortune soon provided the war, and he made the deeds of all the Greeks his own art. He became custodian of what the war brought to pass. He did not allow time to conceal what each side did. The capture of Plataea is known. The ravaging of Attica is, was published. The Athenians' voyage around the Peloponnese was made known. Now Pactus witnessed sea battles, and Thucydides by his writings prevented those things from going unnoticed. The taking of Lesbos is spoken of to this day. There was a battle against the Ambraciots, and time has not stolen away the event. The Spartans' lawless judgment is not unknown. Sphacteria and Pylos, the Athenians' greatest achievement, is not unnoticed. The Corsarians address to the Athenian assembly. The Corinthians reply to them. The charges laid by the Egonetans when they came to Sparta. Archidamus's moderation at the assembly. Sthenolitus's incitement to war. Pericles, too, discounting a Spartan embassy and restraining the Athenians' anger during the plague. These things are preserved for all time in Thucydides' writings. Notice he spends a lot of time praising things that really aren't Thucydides' doings. Thucydides recorded them. But because he recorded them, are you okay? <laughs> oh, we're wincing at Herodotus? Okay, so that's the compare with someone else. Will anyone compare Herodotus to him? But the one, the one narrates, here's a nice, here's a nice antithesis. But the one narrates for pleasure. The other's utterances are all for truth. Now, you might say, which one of them is for pleasure? Herodotus is for pleasure. In other words, I'm telling all the foofy stories, you know, all the, the romance that Thucydides says he lacks. Thucydides is for truth. To the degree that amusement is inferior to truthfulness, to that degree does Herodotus fall short of Thucydides' example. And then epilogue, wrap it up. There is much else that one could say about Thucydides, but the abundance of his praises precludes saying everything. It's a very abrupt, very, there's more I could say, but, but I'm not gonna say it because <laughs> everybody else has said it and we praised him enough. All right, this is what I'd like you to do. Now, we are going to, been, I'm going to give you two weeks on this because can we do one of each? you can do one of each if you want to. You can do it on any one you want. Modern, I don't care. I'm afraid. I'm very afraid. You can do any one you want. No, it can be a fictional character. Do it. Go so for it. Much, we're just like my name yes. <laughs> According to that. Does so. Right. It's it's very close. It's very close. You know. You'll see. So use the guidelines there at the top of eighty-five. Mm -hmm. These six sections. But I do not care. So this week, this week you should at least choose your person. And then start jotting down everything you can think of that falls into these categories, okay? You might not use them all, but just like we used to do the A and I chart, you know, we used to brainstorm, you know, should Antigone have disobeyed Creon? Yes, no, and we jot down all the ideas we can think of. Jot down anything you can think of about this person's homeland, their, their, their 
their actual physical family, the nation that gave birth to them, any of this. Um, no, you can find someone and do an invective. So you would do the opposite. So you would say that their homeland stinks. They come from a lousy group of people and they're all big fat liars and sheiks where he comes from and that sort of thing, all right? Instead of praising his education, you'd say, and they just don't know anything there. They don't care about education. They just sit around twiddling their thumbs and they don't teach their kids anything, all right? So you just do the opposite. If you, yes, you go for it. If it's more entertaining, you can, you can attack. Well, a fictional, a fictional character might be easier to attack. But um, the, the benefit of a fictional character is that you probably know a lot about them if that's a, if that's a fiction that you're into, rather than historical characters or, you know, people you might not know. I mean, a historical character or people today. I mean, just human personages. Okay, I'm not phrasing it well. You know what I mean. You might not automatically know anything about their upbringing or, or anything like that. Whereas you probably do if it's a fictional character. Um, especially if it's a, a fictional uh, a f world or universe where there's lots of, you know, lots of stuff going on. I'm thinking Star Wars is coming into my head, but, you know, that could be Lord of the Rings universe. That could be... But does this make sense to everybody? So, but you need to start this week. You need to choose someone. You need to choose if you're going to praise or blame. And then you need to start jotting down anything you can think of in these categories. And if you do that and you have, okay, here's a list of everything good or bad, depending on what you're doing. I can think of about their, their birth, their education, their achievements. Um, then you have it all in one place and you can just use it to write from. And most of your work is done for you. You just have to put the ideas together. It is okay if these paragraphs are not all the same size. Notice that our Aphthonius, even he, uh, his achievements, his achievement paragraph is quite a bit longer because he counts the achievements that Thucydides recorded as being partly his own because he prevented them from being lost to posterity. But so it's okay. You need to write something about each of these categories. And I challenge you, you can think of something to write. All right, it might, you might have to sit and think a little while. You might have to put your paper down and then go get, you know, a cup of coffee or whatever, and then come back and think about it some more. But you can do this, all right? Does it make sense? So begin it this week, but you do not have to write the whole thing this week. My hope is that you will begin it this week and then you will use the time to think of ideas and gather ideas. This also gives you a little breather. If you choose a famous real person and you don't know a lot about them and you just want to poke around online and find out a little bit about where they're from or their family or whatever, okay? Is that clear? And I'm not even making you do a short answer summer or anything this week. I'm just really, really being very very nice. Point that out. <laughs> I said, do an encomium on myself. Not my achievements. Okay. All right. <laughs> yes. Parallelisms and antithesis. Um, and yeah, see, I was supposed to add new stuff a long time ago. Um, you know what? This will make me, this will make me, okay, this is easy. Whoa, whoa, this will be easy. And here, I need, can somebody give me, can you give me your pencil? I made, I'm making my younger kids do this, so it'll be easy. Let's add alliteration. You can kill two birds with one stone and you can alliterate your parallelism. Ha 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 ha. Um, he, he was crafty, cruel, and cunning. And then I've got alliteration, which alliteration is the re repetition of a beginning sound. And if you only, if you do at least three words, it makes it sound like you meant to do it. Two words sounds like maybe just an accident. And 
four or five or six words make it sound like you're writing a new tongue twister. <laughs> you do not have to write a new tongue twister for me. So you can add this to the back of your book. Do you remember that in the back of your book, in the very, very back, you have an empty sheet and we're writing our elocution elements? Why don't you add alliteration to that? I will spell alliteration for you. Are we ready? A-L-L-I-T-E-R-A-T-I-O-N. Did you start a list, Mark? Did you start a list in the back? Yeah. Okay, I will spell it again. A-L-L-I-T-R. I-T-E-R. I'm sorry, did I do that? A L L I T E R A T I O N. Sorry if I left that E out the first time. Alliteration. <laughs> it's not alliteration. Is that even a word? No, it's not. But it <laughs> sounds like it could be and should be. And that means the repetition of a beginning sound. It doesn't have to be a beginning letter. Notice that king and cook alliterate, even though one starts with a K and one starts with a C. As do ceiling and singer, even though one starts with a C and one starts with an S. Right. So we should have two kinds of parallelism, antithesis and alliteration, which can be a part of one of your other things. All right, we good? Okay. Two weeks. Also because Thucydides is a lot of reading, isn't it? So you know, we'll make you give you a two week assignment. Okay, so <clears throat> we are gonna target just several big things that happened in the Peloponnesian War. And the first one is the revolt, revolt of Lesbos. So I have my map here. Um, do you see Lesbos is this island over here, okay? Remember, these cities on the Ionian coast were largely colonies of Greece and largely colonies of Athens, frankly. And in Athens' spread of the empire, they have taken over most of these islands and much of the coast here, and having problems up here. And as we learned from the uh, Naxos and Thassos, which is one of these islands up here, uh, re rebelling, well, rebelling is your only option if you want to break out of the Delian League because there is no graciously leave. There is no, excuse me, we're, we're, we're going to leave now. We're going to take our toys and go home because we don't like the way you play anymore. No. There's, there is no leave. There is only stay. So, uh, Lesbos, though, gets it in their minds that they're kind of sick and tired of uh, providing ships. Now, Mytilene, we hear a lot about Mytilene. Mytilene is a town just right on, on the, the southern tip here. And so this is a pretty big island. It's got numerous towns on it, right? But the, the people in Mytilene, apparently they were movers and shakers of this whole thing. And they convince uh, Lesbos that they ought to <coughs> rebel and go over to Sparta. Now, I think I told you that there were categories of allies. And so you could be in the league and you could actually provide soldiers, a quota of soldiers. You could provide a quota of ships. And if you chose to do one of those things, you were sort of a higher status. Because it's sort of like allies of equals, right? I contribute ships, you contribute ships, we're all one big happy family. But the people who just donated money, <laughs> donated, the pe people who were forced to fork over money, they were considered not, not as allies as some of the other allies. So those of you who read Animal Farm, you know, all are allies. All allies are equal, but some allies are more equal than others, okay? But, but Lesbos was on the, the upper track. 
They gave ships. And so Athens tended to treat them a little better, which made it just more of a knife to the gut when they revolt, revolted. Because Athens says, what the heck? We, we treated you well. We, you were on the A-list of allies. And this is what you do? Yeah. So, when we, uh, so the first thing I want to look at is the story of this outbreak. Um, it says, uh, I, I'm, if, if you want to look in your book, if you've got your book, it's fine. Um, I'm going to start at the beginning on page 159. It says, <clears throat> Some dissident persons in Mytilene informed the Athenians that the Mytilenians were forcibly uniting the island under their sovereignty and that the preparations about which they were so active were all concerted with their kindred, the Boeotians, and with the Spartans with a view to revolt and that unless they were immediately prevented, Athens would lose Lesbos you will lose Lesbos, which means I will lose their ships, I will lose their money, their manpower. <coughs> this is why Athens doesn't want anyone to revolt. Do you remember what the Corsarians argued initially at the very beginning of the book? And they said, we have a fleet. It's going to go to somebody. Somebody's going to beat us. <coughs> Hang on. Let's take a look. The ones that make your eyes water. Everybody says, <laughs> why are you crying? <laughs> I'm not. If I'm at church, people think I'm so holy. It's breaking the tears. What is it? That it's always one side or the other side. It's never, and, the, and then only that eye waters. Wow. <clears throat> Okay, so we don't want resources to fall into the wrong hands. That's why we have to run around and keep everybody in line. And um, uh, my eye is still watering. Um, Mytilene travels to Sparta. And I just have to ask you for a minute. If somebody betrays their former alliance and comes to you, what sort of, yes, exactly. That's exactly the question. What sort of person do you think they are? Because if they gave the shaft to their former companions, maybe they'll do the same thing to you when the time comes. <clears throat> the job of Mytilene is to convince them, to convince Sparta. We, we're reasonable in making this move to you. And they say this, we did not become the allies of the Athenians for the subjugation of all the Hellenes, but allies of the Hellenes for their liberation from the Mede. And as long as the Athenians led us fairly, we followed them loyally. But when we saw them relax their hostility to the Mede and try to make the allies their subjects, then our apprehensions began. Would you mind going around the corner and grabbing my purse for me, Neil? It's either on the table. I need to get a Kleenex out. <sighs> All because of a tickle in your throat. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Okay, so their argument is what? For not staying with the, with the Athens, with the Athenians anymore. 
Yeah. <clears throat> this isn't what we signed up for. We didn't sign up to enslave Greece. We signed up to just keep people free from, from uh, Persia. They warned Sparta this. It is not in Attica. By the way, Attica is the area of Greece where Athens is. It is not in Attica that the war will be decided, as some imagine, but in the countries by which Attica is supported. Sparta keeps coming in every, every spring, right, and burning their crops, burning their stuff. Where are they getting food from? They're having it shipped in. We want to we want to stop Athens. We got to shut down the league because they're being supported by all of these member members. And the more of them you can get to come over to your side, the the faster you can shut it down. Because it's not oh a little bit of forty days of burning stuff isn't going to decide the war. Shutting down their supplies that's what what's going to decide it. Um, And listen to this. This is uh, uh, support for these words. Thucydides tells us. At that time, 100 ships guarded Attica, Euboea, and Salamis. A hundred more were cruising around the Peloponnesus, besides those employed at Potidea and other places, making a grand total of 250 vessels employed on active service in a single summer. It was this with Potidea that most exhausted her revenues. Potidea being blockaded by a force of hoplites, each drawing two drachmas a day, one for himself, one for his servant, which amounted to 3,000 at first, and was kept at this number down to the end of the siege, besides 1,600 with Formio, who went away before it was over, and the ships being all paid at the same rate. In this way, her money was wasted at first, and this was the largest number of ships ever manned by her. They paid all these people. The crews of all these 250 ships that are sailing around, they're not doing it for free. They've got to pay them. And <clears throat> another play, I don't know if I marked it or not. He, he went in, he said something about, uh, uh, oh, it's the, it's the footnote. It's the footnote here. Uh, it costs one talent a month to keep a trireme at sea or one talent a day to keep a fleet of 30 triremes at sea. Thus, if Athens really deployed 250 triremes, these ships and her siege would have cost her treasury more than nine talents a day. And a talent is 50, uh, slightly over 50 pounds of gold, silver. This is a lot of money. It was a lot of money. Every ally that comes over that's less money for her to, to supply the ship. Makes sense? Um, so, uh, Mytilene, uh, Sparta says, yes, yes, a thousand times yes, we will help you. And uh, then they proceed to send ships and they just kind of cruise around. They, they just stop at island, like they thought they were on one of those Mediterranean cruises, apparently. And, we just stopped, and we had dinner here, and in the meantime, in the meantime, Athens gets wind of, of what has happened and sends some ships. <clears throat> they also send a garrison over from the mainland, over from Asia Minor, and blockade Mytilene, and Mytilene's waiting. What? Well, Sparta, where are you, Sparta? And finally, they can't hold out anymore, and they just go over to the Athenians. They can't hold out the siege anymore. And then Sparta shows up. I know. I don't I don't think there's anything you could ask that I have an answer for, but go ahead. I feel like this war is just like so Athens is like doing stuff, Sparta's kind of just like hanging out in the corner, just watching them, waiting for Athens to make a wrong move. <coughs> Yes. Well, remember, okay, so we always, even though we consider Thucydides to be pretty even-handed, I mean, he is writing about the group of people who exiled him mm -hmm. because he didn't get the job done. But he is Athenian. Mm -hmm. but, but remember how he painted that picture 
we talked about the last couple of weeks, um, of the slow, deliberative Spartans. They're conservative in the sense that conservative means you preserve the status quo. You preserve what you have. This is their strong suit. Athens, like, yeah, let's try it. Let's do it. That line that said a, a, uh, <clears throat> a an opportunity missed was practically a failure with them. But we could have done it, and we didn't. Oh, we should have jumped on that while we had the chance. They're quick. Also, we see something else at, in the story, as we're going to finish this story of Middle East. They are a democracy in the most complete and worst sense of the word. There is a reason that Aristotle wrote on politics and he said, democracy, mm. and there's a reason that the founding fathers did not set up a pure democracy in America, because people are fickle and crazy. They just are. And when you get them in groups, they get even worse. Athens was just, oh yeah, I like that idea, let's do it. Well, the, the Athenians brought back uh, prisoners from Mytilene. They brought back a Spartan guy who was there, uh, not who hadn't come with the ships, but he had been there kind of instigating. He was an instigator. Uh, Sel Selethus. Okay. <clears throat> Upon the arrival of the prisoners with Selethus, the Athenians at once put the latter to death. Although he offered, among other things, to procure the withdrawal of the Peloponnesians from Plataea, which was still under siege. But he is the enemy. They've, they've declared war on Sparta and like he's a prisoner of war and they put him to death. Okay. And after deliberating as to what they should do with the former, which would be the uh, prisoners from Middling, in the fury of the moment determined to put to death not only the prisoners of Athens, but the whole adult male population of Middling and to make slaves of the women and children. They just all got to, let's kill them all. Let's kill all the men and enslave all the rest of them. These were their allies. These were their former allies. So they voted and then they immediately send a ship with the message, kill them all. Now, the next day, however, they get up and it says, the morrow brought repentance with it and the reflection on the horrid, horrid cruelty of the decree which condemned a whole city to the fate merited only by the guilty. Not everybody was revolting. You know, it's the common people. Like they do whatever their leaders tell them to do. This was no sooner perceived by the Mytilenean ambassadors at Athens than they moved the authorities to put the question again to the vote. Vote again. Vote, vote if you really want to do this. All right. So they call an assembly and they're going to vote. And we meet a man we haven't met before. Cleon, son of Cleonetus, uh, the same who had carried the former motion of putting the Mytilenians to death, the most violent man at Athens, and at the time by far, the most powerful with the people, came forward again and spoke as follows. He said, among many other things, the most alarming feature in the case is the constant change of measures with which we appear to be threatened and our seeming ignorance of the fact that bad laws which are never changed are better for a city than good laws which have no authority. I'd rather have bad laws and stick with them than be changing our minds all the time and put good laws in place, but people don't pay attention to them because they're like, oh, they're always changing their tune. He goes on to say, get my pages apart. Our mistake has been to distinguish the Mytilenians as we have done. Had they been long ago treated like the rest, they never would have so far forgotten themselves. Human nature being as surely made arrogant 
by consideration as it is awed by firmness. Our problem is we treated them so nice. That made them want to, to rebel, you know, because they had that better status. They were giving ships instead of just money. Pfft, we should never have been nice to them that way. If we treated them firmly from the beginning, this wouldn't have happened. If they were right in rebelling, you must be wrong in ruling. However, if right or wrong, you determine to rule, you must carry out your principle and punish the Mytilenians as your interest requires, or else you must give up your empire and cultivate honesty without danger. You're just going to have to give it all up. Unless you do what is necessary to keep these people in line. Creon's a tough guy. All right. So <clears throat> he says his piece. He says, uh, and then another guy stands up. We can't do this. We can't kill all these people. This is what he says. Um, For if those who gave the advice and those who took it suffered equally, you would judge more calmly. As it is, you visit the disasters into which the whim of the moment may have led you upon the single person of your advisor, not upon yourselves, his numerous companions in error. However, I've not come forward either to oppose or accuse in the matter of Mytilene. The question before us as sensible men is not their guilt, but our interests. Interestingly, uh, a Diodotus, <coughs> the speaker, is never going to argue it's wrong to kill all those people. He says, it's not in our interest to kill all those people. Do you guys see the difference? This is a very creepy and alarming difference. We are not in a court of justice, but in a political assembly. And the question is not justice, but how to make the Mytilenians useful to Athens. Based on that, they send a ship <coughs> to save them. And... Uh, and they do save them. The ship barely gets there before the other one. The first one sails rather slowly because nobody really wants to rush when their messages kill everybody. In this case, taking a cruise of the Greek islands was not a bad thing. The people, however, were very motivated on the second ship because they were saving lives. And so they rode for all they were worth and they, they ate in shifts and they never stopped at night or anything and they just got there and they saved everybody's lives. Now it was in their interest to do this. You know, if, <clears throat> if you see everybody there killed and you think about rebelling, first of all, once you're in, you figure I'm gonna die no matter what. I'm, I'm not gonna give up and surrender myself. If they're just going to kill us all anyway, it doesn't matter. We, we might as well just see it through. Rather that Athens would like to persuade you to come back to their side if you, if you rebel. And the only way to do that is gentleness, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what do you want to say, Marta? Um, so why is it in, in Athens' interest? Because, first of all, when, when other, in other kingdoms, we, you know, often killing, massacring these people randomly, just like, oh, just kill them all. Yes. You know, us. I feel like other, other people are going to be like, maybe we should go <laughs> as soon as we can. Maybe we should go as soon as we can. Well, if they, if they see them being like, more like, lenient, yeah, or if they see if, them... If, if Athens is massacring... Oh, oh, I see, I see. Like well, because they don't want people to go as fast as they can, like, right? They, like, they yeah. want the allies to stay with them. And I skipped over this, but he also points something else out. You know, all these cities, they're, they're not necessarily democracies. A lot of them are run by an, an aristocracy or an oligarchy. And it's that oligarchy, it's that few that tend to want to go over to the other side. The people, they're like, yay, we're pro-Athens through and through. We fly the Athens flag and we wear the jersey and we're, we're fans. All right. <clears throat> But if they just indiscriminately kill everybody, the, the upper class movers and shakers and the people alike, then this is going to alienate the, the party in all these cities that tends to be on Athens' side to begin with. So 
I mean, Cleon has, I mean, harshness has a point. But, but in the end, mercy won the day. By mercy, they did go ahead and put to death the people who were the ringleaders, and, and they did sell them into slavery. I mean, it's not like they just slapped him on the wrist and said, don't do that, and let him go. There was punishment, but it wasn't death. Uh, so I guess that was, uh, I guess bl I just blew the first question out of the water here. What changed the Athenians' minds on how does Thucydides describe Cleon? Cleon is the most violent man in Athens, and the Athenians changed their minds because they were, they were convinced it was in their interests to change their minds, not because it was wicked to put a whole town to death. There's a big difference there. Okay, the second big thing that happened in your reading was the capture of an island, uh, Sphacteria. Um, you know, I'm going to skip this because I don't think we have time for it. Um, so uh, th there was a there was a Athenian general, Demosthenes, I think, and he decided that it would be really cool to fortify Pylos. Pylos, you might remember, is the home of our friend Nestor. Our talkative friend Nestor was once king of Pylos. Okay, but this is this is many years later. And, uh, and because the, the method of operations here in the war is every year the Peloponnesians come across into Attica and they ravage here. And then the Athenians get in their boats and they come over here and they ravage here. And then everybody goes home. In addition to into sieges, oh yeah, oh yeah. So so he said, oh you know this is a really good uh, place. This would be a great uh, fort base of operations when we go ravage the Peloponnese, and we can have some ships here. We can have some supplies here, and and we can you know uh, build fortifications on the outside. And then we've got fleet to patrol the harbor. And in the harbor, it, 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 there's a picture in your book. Uh, there's this harbor area, and then there's a long, skinny island in front of it. So it makes this lovely harbor because the it breaks the wind, you know, in the waves. But also, uh, it makes narrow entrances into the harbor where you could guard it easily. All right. So they they set this up, but the Spartans get wind of it, and they come and attack before they really get things set up, right? And uh, the Spartans are trying to shut them off, so they block them in by sea. Um, the Athenians can't get out. Uh, they're being attacked by land, uh, and the Spartans take, oh, several hundred guys, and they station them on this island, all right, and to watch and make sure nobody tries to get in and out, and they've got some, you know, ships uh, at their disposal. But the ships are removed, and eventually the tide turns, uh, allied forces come with ships, and now the Spartans are on the, on the downside. They, they had the upper hand. But the reinforcements came, and these guys get trapped on the island. Hundreds of Spartan guys are trapped on this island of Sphacteria, and they can't. They have no way to get off, and they're being blockaded on all sides. They, we learn that uh, they hired, the Spartans hired blockade runners to bring food in. They even had guys, know, like super divers or something like that, who would take skins of supplies, you know, to keep them dry, and they would dive under the water and swim as far as they could and get in, you know, unseen, and deliver supplies and then swim back out. Um, eventually, though, the Athenians catch on to the divers and also the blockade runners. Um, <clears throat> and they don't know, uh, they, they don't want to land troops on this island because the island had a little fort that the Spartans are using, and also it's very wooded, and they can't see. You know, it's a risky moment when you're a soldier and you're getting out of a boat. You know, I'm not a soldier, but I can see how, I mean, have you ever gotten out of a boat? Mm -hmm. Like, it's just a trick, you know, the boat's still moving and you're trying to get on land. And if there's not a nice dock there, if you're stepping out onto rocks or, <clears throat> it's a dicey moment and it's hard to be ready to, you know, stab someone and be getting out of a boat at the same time. And, and they're just gonna run out of the woods at you. So this is a problem. But the Spartans really, really want 
uh, their guys back. And so they are willing to make a truce for a year. All right. Um, and uh, it just, it doesn't, it, it doesn't fly. All right. They, but they're trying to evacuate their guys. And it goes on and on and on. And finally, we meet, meet Cleon again. Cleon has a very large mouth. Um, Cleon is the one who wouldn't, wouldn't make peace, wouldn't make this truce. But now, oh man, they just can't get those guys off that island. It goes on and on, and they're spending money. This is costing us money to blockade that blasted island and have those ships there. And they're ships we can't use for something else, and we're getting kind of tired of it. And Cleon, you're a jerk. But you're a jerk, Cleon. So Cleon, perceiving the disfavor with which he was now regarded for having stood in the way of the convention, now said that their informants did not speak the truth. And upon messengers recommending that if he did not believe them, they send some commissioners to see, to see what was going on in the island. Cleon himself and Theagenes were chosen by the Athenians as commissioners. Aware that he would now be obliged either to say what had already been said by the men whom he was slandering, or be proved a liar if he said the contrary, he told the Athenians, whom he saw to be not altogether disinclined for a fresh expedition, that instead of sending commissioners and wasting their time and opportunities, if they believed what was told them, they ought to sail against the men. And pointing at Nicias, son of Nicaratus, then general, whom he hated, he tauntingly said that it would be easy if they had men for generals to sail with a force and take those in the island, and that if he had himself been in command, he would have done it. That's a if we had a man in charge, point to them. Nicias, seeing the Athenians murmuring against Cleon for not sailing, now if it seemed to him so easy, seeing himself the object of attack, told him that for all that the generals cared, he might take what force he chose and make the attempt. At first, Cleon fancied that this resignation was merely a figure of speech and was ready to go, but finding that it was seriously meant, he drew back and said that Nicias, not he, was general, being now frightened and having never supposed that Nicias would go so far as to retire in his favor. Oh, you, you want ships to go get it taken care of? You got it. When are you leaving? Good luck with that. Interestingly, however, oh, I love this line. The Athenians could not help laughing at his empty words, while sensible men comforted themselves with the reflection that they must gain in either circumstance. Either they would get rid of Cleon, whom they rather hope, which they rather hoped, <laughs> or if disappointed in this expectation, he would reduce the Spartans. Either Cleon will go and he'll win, that's a win for us, or we'll get rid of Cleon. And that's a win for us. So they send him. Cleon. Yes. Unbelievably, he pulls it off. And in a couple of months, he gets those guys off that island. Now, he's helped tremendously by a couple of things. One, the guys on the island are getting really, really hungry and tired of being there. <laughs> Second of all, somebody lit a campfire and it got out of control and they burned off half the trees on the island, <laughs> which meant they had nowhere to hide anymore, you know? Well, we're good. laughing, but it's really not good. It's like, you let it burn down half. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe they didn't have buckets. <laughs> No. Hey, you go fight forest fires and then you come back and tell us if it's easy. So they were easy to see. When they landed on the island, the guys were easy to see. Oh, man. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, 
derogatory well, to do. I say we put Elaine on a forest, start burning it, and make her put out the fire by herself. <laughs> well, if you, if you so started burning it out of the forest, like, would it have yeah. not? What? Why would I have a purpose to put it out, though? Oh, um, you know what? Well, because you're trapped in the middle of it. And then <laughs> yeah. you, you literally were there, too. Though. We you skipped a couple of questions, and I need to go back. Um, let's let's finish let's finish this uh, section out though. Here I've I've skipped on to book four and I didn't mean to, but not a problem. Um, yeah, I just kind of botched our whole question thing, so I'm just going to run with it. We'll go back and do the questions later. Um, so interestingly. Uh, Let me find that picture. There's a picture in your book that I wanted to point out. Oh, where was it? Okay. 426, 441, 453. Oh, here we go. Oh, I can't find it. Does anybody remember where the picture is of the of the shield? You know what I'm talking about, don't you? It's um, here. I took notes. Uh, Spartan is a Scythera. Oh, good for you. Um, oh, very good. Um, and this was one of the questions I asked you. Um, I'm on book four now uh, about the intelligent arrows. Um, <coughs> intelligent arrows. Um, okay. It says indeed some people. So after, after, uh, after the blockade is ended and the guys in Spectaria are brought back to Athens, uh, people could scarcely believe that those who had surrendered were of the same stuff as the fallen because they looked so scroungy. Ooh, and they'd been holed up on that island and they were hungry. And an Athenian ally who sometime after insultingly asked one of the prisoners from the island if those that had fallen were noble and good men because you look like a bunch of wrath rabble. You're the ones that died there? Were they, were they better than you? Received as an answer that is that the atractos, that is the arrow, would be worth a great deal if it could pick out noble and good men from the rest, in allusion to the fact that the killed were those whom the stones and arrow happened to hit. Do the, do the good men fall and the bad men make it through? Do the bad men fall or the good men make it through? These survivors said no. Chance happens in a battle. And some of us make it through and some of them don't. But arrows or bullets don't make a decision. They're not intelligent. You just, you take your chances when you're on the battlefield. Okay, so <clears throat> then there's this, this uh, shield, and it struck my attention even when I was there too. I brought my scrapbook, but this shield is in the, is in the uh, Agora Museum. And it's all beaten, it's beaten up as it looks like in the picture and, but you know, it's stunning because I looked and I'm like, wait a minute, it's a Spartan shield. Spartans don't leave their shields. Like boot, Spartan don't weaponry is pretty big, right? And just, I, look at the dents. Oh my gosh. This is from Spacteria. This is from that island. When they took the island. Oh, I thought it was kind of cool. Come back with your or yes, yes. Um, yeah, we're going to sail on. I'll go back to the questions in a minute, but um, I want to hit the other uh, of the big things that happened um, is, uh, uh, is Brasidas's the Spartan general's, uh, campaign up north, and uh, Amphipolis. Let's flip up to that. Um, I don't know if it is on my, 
map here, making sure. Okay. No, we don't even have the rivers up here. Amphipolis is, is up here. All right, there's a river here and it's Amphipolis. But remember, there are towns all over the place up here. Potidea, that place that was besieged, was up here. And <clears throat> um, this is the last question I asked you. What seems to be the Spartan General Brasidas' strategy? Did anybody notice, like, what's happening? Big picture at the end of book four. He likes to, like, get cities to revolt against Athens. Yes. Like, that's his, like, let's revolt. <laughs> let's revolt. And he goes around, and he's got the kindness thing going. So he, he does things like tell them, uh, if there are any Athenians in there, you can leave before the city comes over to us. Take it, pack up your stuff and leave. We'll give you five days. Yes. He is. Um, here, I'm. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, it says uh, he offered to come out as many as they chose to their homes without fearing through their rights, sent a herald to invite the Athenians to accept a truce and evacuate with their property. Um, this was at Tironi. Um I have a, just a second. Scione, he felt, was too like an island for them to attempt to relieve it. Indeed, with regard to these cities, he was actively seeking their betrayal. His method is, if, if he's not already working with someone from the inside, hey, shh, there it is. If he's not already working with someone from the inside, he tries to just stand up in front of the walls and basically offer an amnesty if they'll come over in really good terms. And it's very effective. But he, he parks it in front of Amphipolis up here in Thrace. And unfortunately, the party opposed to the traitors proved numerous enough to prevent the gates being immediately thrown open. And in concert with Eucles the general, who had come from Athens to defend the place, sent to the other commander in Thrace, Thucydides, son of Alorus, the author of this history, who was at the Isle of Thassos, a Parian colony, Half a, day, half a day's sail from Amphipolis to tell him to come to their relief. On receipt of this message, he at once set sail with seven ships, which he had with him, in order, if possible, to reach Amphipolis in time to prevent its capitulation. And he doesn't make it. It says, they gave up the city and late in the same day, Thucydides and his ships entered the harbor of Aeon, Brasidas just having got hold of Amphipolis and having been within a night of taking Aeon. Had the ships been less prompt in relieving it, in the morning it would have been his. So Thucydides is telling us the story. He's saying, you know what? I didn't save Amphipolis, but I, another half a day and they would have taken a second city. However, this sort of <clears throat> argument doesn't really play with Athens. Mm -hmm. This is the event for which he is exiled. He failed to come to the aid of Amphipolis and it fell. They decided to go over to Sparta and he lost his command because of it. <sighs> oh, speaking of which, um, I wonder if I'll be able to find this. I skipped over into book four and I didn't mean to. Um, shoot, I'm pretty sure I put a flag there. You know, I even sat down on the floor in my library last night and I went through all of my flags so I could keep the whole story straight. 
but it didn't work. Um, the guys, it's, it involved uh, Coursera. It involved a revolt in Coursera, which is something else that happened, and I did not bother to go over it. Coursera, you might remember, is the place where everything broke out originally. And um, uh, there were two parties in Coursera, and one group was trying to bring the other group into the city, and uh, Athens sent help, and uh, Corinth and Sparta sent help. And uh, the Athenians uh, ended up coming home because the Corsarians got together and they decided to uh, get over it, to, to patch up their differences, okay? Um, so the, the Athenians come home and they get in trouble in Athens. Oh, I can't find it. Oh, this just frustrates me. Um, the Athenians came home and they said, well, they made peace. And then the two, the ambassadors came back and they got in trouble because they said, you, you could have taken the whole place. You, somebody must have bribed you. You, sh you should have gone back there and taken everything over. Ugh. They made peace terms and they decided to send us away. No, I bet you were bribed. We're throwing you out too. This is how they treated their people. Think of Themistocles. Rascal as he might have been sometimes. He did save Greece when they threw him out. All right, let's backtrack and look at those questions that I botched. Um, we talked about Mytilene. Um, I asked you, what caused the Spartans to side with the Thebans and destroy the Plataeans when they argued over Plataea's fate? Let me give you a backstory for just a minute. Plataea was a town just uh, somewhat to the north of Athens. Plataea was the site of the wonderful final victory over the Persians. Plataeans went out and they stood firm. And the Spartan general Pausanias gave them an opportunity to just be neutral and not have to pay taxes for the support of anything because of their wonderful service in the cause of Greece. But you fast forward 50 years and they're now being besieged by Sparta because they asked Athens for help. Did anyone come up with anything? I even told you where to look. Yes, yes. Um, they, they, th this poor town that had once been the savior of Greece surrendered based on the fact that the Spartans assured them that they would be fair, that they would look into their cause and they would put them on trial or whatever and only the guilty would be, would be punished. But <clears throat> they did not know that the trial was going to consist of one question. What have you done to help Sparta and its allies in the present war? Don't give me your garbage about the Persian War. That's ancient history now. I don't care what you did in that war. What have you did, done to help Sparta and her allies in the present war? Well, they did nothing. Because A, for part of the time they were neutral and then they started getting attacked and they went to Athens, the only people who would help them. Poor guy came out and he defended himself admirably. That's not fair. Basically, I can summarize his, his speech. That's not fair. We thought we were going to have a fair assessment of our guilt or innocence. <sighs> Such were the words of the Thebans. The Thebans said, kill him. The Spartan judges decided that the question whether they had received any service from the Plataeans in the war was a fair one for them to put, as they had always invited them to be neutral. Um, they brought them in again one by one and asked each of them the same question. That is to say, 
whether they had done the Spartans and allies any service in the war. And upon their saying they had not, they took them out and slew them all without exception. The number of Plataeans thus massacred was not less than 200, with 25 Athenians who had shared the siege. The women were taken as slaves. Um, and then the final question I asked you was about uh, revolution. Corsera, as I had told you before, this island, was trying, had opposing parties and each party trying to overthrow the other. And I asked you, how does revolution affect the meaning of words, promises, oaths, and nobility? Yeah. Do you have anything to add to that before I read? It's a long section. I'm not going to read all that Thucydides says. But remember, Thucydides tells us that he is writing a book as a possession for all time. And so his point is, this has happened in this place in this time, but these things happen. And beware of what happens, what the, what the effects of this sort of thing is when we have two factions at each other's throats and you know what one could argue today we have factions at each other's throats over over a number of issues in society and so he says um, words had to change their ordinary meaning and to take that which was now given them reckless audacity came to be considered the courage of a loyal supporter. Prudent hesitation, specious cowardice. If you hesitate, I just want to weigh both sides. Oh, you're a coward. Moderation was held to be a cloak for unmanliness. Ability to see all sides of a question, incapacity to act on any. Frantic violence became the attribute of manliness cautious plotting a justifiable means of self-defense. The advocate of extreme measures was always trustworthy. His opponent, a man to be suspected. To succeed in a plot was to have a shrewd head, to divine a plot still shrewder, but to try to provide against having to do either was to break up your party and to be afraid of your adversaries. Concocting a plot that makes you shrewd finding out a plot that makes you even shrewder, trying to make it so you don't have to do any of those, loser, coward. It said, he says, thus religion was in honor with neither party, but the use of fair phrases to arrive at guilty ends was in high reputation. I was reading this and I was thinking about the things today that we just the names we call things. To be, um, I because our culture wars are largely a matter of name calling, aren't they? I mean, we, and <clears throat> and sometimes the names are appropriate, but sometimes they're not. But you know, we think about even pro life and pro choice. No one wants to be anti life, and no one wants to call themselves anti choice. You know. So, so, so we have two arguments and they're passing over each other. Like we're concerned about life, well we're concerned about, about individual autonomy. You know, and we can't keep missing each other because we're calling each other different things. I've mentioned this before. Um, you know, it wasn't, and, and this is not a, meant to be necessarily a political comment, it's just a, it is a political comment though, and it's just an observation. Not very long ago, people who came into our country through illegal means were called illegal aliens. They're alien because they're foreign and they're here, they're Ill it's illegal. There are ways to come into this country that are sanctioned by the government. And then suddenly they started calling them um, undocumented, which doesn't sound so bad. You just don't have the right, you're undocumented. 
And then not long after that, they started calling them applied to their, their children, dreamers. Well, that's positively good. Who, who doesn't love a dreamer? And like I said, I'm not trying to make a statement on the existence of illegal immigration so much as notice that we just start calling it something different to make it seem like something else. So marriage is no longer a man and a woman in many states. And it's like you could pick up a circle and if you get enough people to call it a square, now we're gonna call it a square. And, 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 the, and the craziness, again, and I'm, I'm not afraid to say this at all because I'm pretty sure we're all on the same side of this issue. I'm not gonna call a man a she. I'm not gonna abuse my language that way. <sighs> or a they, or that's just wrong because it's always plural. You can't be a they unless you're possessed by multiple evil spirits. So, <laughs> I'm gonna call you they. You're singular and you're a he, she, or it. <sighs> anyway, point being, it's interesting because 2,500 years ago, Thucydides is making the same observation that, you know, we're calling what used to be prudence, now we're calling it cowardice. What used to be rash, uh, 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 lack of foresight, is now courage. And this is what happens when societies are in turmoil and we're trying to get the better of each other. And the people who are moderate, who are in the middle, that's the only thing everybody can agree on. We don't like them. Anybody who says, no, wait a minute, let's just think about this. Let's think it through. We don't like them. They're now cowards. I just, I found that interesting since we have a lot of name calling going on in society today. And, and, and to stop and think, well, why? <sighs> think about the people who are, I don't know, voices for moderation in any, in any of society's problems. And they tend to be the people that everybody hates on. And it was the same in Thucydides' time. Um, okay, so I'm sorry I, I botched up uh, uh, some of the questions. We talked about all the stuff I wanted to talk about. We just didn't do it in the order, and I missed some flags. I thought I had it all together, too. All right, um, we are going to read the next two books. Book five continues much as things have been. Book six, book six and seven. So this coming week you'll start it and then you'll finish it the next week. Book six and seven are the famous expedition to Sicily. And just as you put your books away, I didn't talk about this at all, but hope you noticed there were some asides in Sicily. Stuff has been happening in Sicily. Um, because these are Greek towns that were sent out there uh, to be colonies years ago, and they can't get along. Sicily has issues, all right, with getting along with each other. And so, and they keep calling in. Well, Athens, would you like to help us? Well, Sparta, would you like to help us? Remember, there are also Greek cities on the toe of Italy that's kicking the ball of Sicily. These are all Greek peoples, and so there's connections. Uh, so we've seen it go back and forth, but in book six, full-blown expedition to Sicily is gonna get launched, and it's not a good thing. And we're gonna meet a guy named Alcibiades, or Alcibiades, who was just apparently a very attractive party boy with a lot of charisma and could just drink people under the table and just everybody liked him. And when Alcibiades says, let's go attack Sicily. It's like, yeah, let's go. It's also a lesson in choosing your leaders. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Maybe not based on their, you know, looks, how the, 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 the pleasure of listening to sound bites and how good they look on TV. Probably not the best way to choose one's leaders. All right. So go ahead and read the next two books. Start thinking about a personage who you'd like to either just praise to the skies or roundly trounce in an encomium or an invective and start gathering information for those people's background. What, what would make them good? What's anything and everything? There is no point too little that you could generate to either praise them for or blame them for. 
the more information you have at your disposal, the easier it is to write. Okay? I will let you go. Thank you for class. Bye-bye.